Why do we light candles before we have our church service? Why do we have candles in the sanctuary? This is a test. To represent the Holy Spirit. To represent that the Spirit of God is there with us. So, the Spirit of God is here with us. Whenever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with you. All right? Let's open with a word of prayer. God, as we gather together this evening, as we can continue to seek the future for our church, well, we pray that your spirit would fill us, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us discernment, that you would give us kind, wise words, that you would let us understand other people's point of view, other people's perspectives. And Lord, that you would teach us and guide us in the way that you would have us to go. Lord, bless our time together. Bless our discussion. Bless us so that our church can be a blessing now and in the future for your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 That's okay. It's about a 15-minute video, and I will put a link on there for you. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll put some links for some other uh, videos uh, for you, because uh, there's a lot of information that is available about disaffiliation from the United Methodist Church. I think just about everybody uh, is here this evening, and if someone's got an extra piece of paper, or just take one of these handouts, turn it upside down, and just write down the people that are here this evening, or send it around for a sign-up sheet, one, one or the other, we, we can want to kind of keep track. I'll start one here, here and move around. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And uh, I turn that thing off because it's just kind of aggravating. Technology is wonderful when it works. <laughs> Again, thank you. There's a second little handout, a short little uh, schedule of the continuing meetings that we have as we continue to discern the future of our church. And essentially, briefly, simply, you know, do we say uh, in what, what some people are now calling the continuing United Methodist Church? Or do we decide that we're going to do something different, that God's going to call us to something different? And I don't know what the answer to that is, because we've not gone through this process yet. But we're going to go through this process, and we're going to do it as well as we can do it, and we'll, we'll, we'll decide where God is calling us. So there's a schedule. I think one date was off on there. We inadvertently put a Saturday meeting instead of a Sunday meeting, according to the date. Uh, but this should be corrected and this will be as a handout for this Sunday as well, but that is the continuing uh, meetings that we'll have concerning disaffiliation and what we want to do here with the United Methodist Church uh, moving forward. So uh, tonight what we want to talk about is the United Methodist understanding of human sexuality. And because that, that's actually kind of not the core of the argument, but it's the identified argument. It's the argument that everybody wants to point to. If, 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 a, a, if a newspaper or a television station wants to make a story about this, that's the thing that they want to point at because they don't really have a deep understanding of really kind of the long-term organizational issues of what's uh, going on here. Um, I have... Your handout tonight is an updated, frequently asked questions from the Holston Conference. Uh, the, we, we did one with the church council five, six weeks ago, and uh, it has been updated slightly with some additional information since that time. So this is the newest version that is available. This was downloaded today, uh, although th this was updated a few weeks ago. I will continue to look at it. If they update this further, I will make more copies of this available. But I invite you to take a look at this. Some of you have already seen this. Um, some of you have read it online. It is on the Holston Conference website. And a lot of this stuff is available online for people to look at. But I invite you to, to take a look at this stuff. I kind of fully understand the process that we're in uh, right now. 
Let's talk a little bit about the United Methodist Church and about our understanding of sexuality, because that is something that we really have talked about a lot. Although the disagreement inside the United Methodist Church is larger than this, because really some people want to kind of pare it down and kind of make it simplistic, say, well, you've got one group that wants to be progressive and inclusive and inviting of everybody, and you've got another group that's kind of like old school, you know, to be, you know, around here we call them hillbillies, in Texas we call them rednecks or goat ropers, it just depends on whatever part of the country that you're in. Unsophisticated people want to be bigots and want to discriminate against stuff they don't understand. And, well, it's really kind of more of a theological thing. And it goes back to what is your view of the Bible? And what is your view of the Christian life? And what is the role of the Christian? And how are we to act individually and to respond to our faith? So, to me, a lot of it goes back to how do you understand the Bible what does the term biblical authority mean to you? How do you read the Bible? Do you read it strictly, literally? Uh, I, I, I read the Bible in, in, in a way that theologians call neo-literal, uh, which, which means I read it literally because a lot of it is very plain to understand. Some of it is hard to understand. But you have to read it literally. When Jesus was making an exaggeration to make a point, I read that literally as an exaggeration to make a point. He doesn't, he doesn't mean that you've got a plank in your eye and you have to take it out before you can see somebody else's problem. It's, it's an exaggeration because he's telling a story, and sometimes we use exaggerations in stories to make a point. When I read Paul's letter to a church that was having trouble, I read that literally as... Paul's letter to that church. When I read an Old Testament story, I, I mean, I, I mean, I read it literally. That doesn't just mean I read it simplistically as the words on the. I read it literally as it was written, as we understand that it was written. And then, of course, you have to understand it through the the lens of the time and the culture as well, because they 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 they, they don't write the way that we write. They don't process some things the way that we process. And in, 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 in some ways, they process stuff in a, in a deeper, more complex, more kind of multivalent way. Because when the Jewish people, when Jewish rabbis would teach, they would use stories to teach. And these stories were always multivalent. They always had multiple layers of meaning. And the more you thought about it, it's like peeling an onion. The more you thought about it, the more you would say, oh, that means this, and this means this. And it's just, it's, it, it, they're very deep, they're very complex. And you can't just take that cartoon version of it and just, you know, take the surface meaning and say, well, that's what it means for, at all times for all people at all things. It's, it's a lot more complex than that. So, we have identified sexuality as a problem inside the United Methodist Church because it is a problem. But the, the disagreements run deeper and are more, more complex than this. So, if we're going to start this, I don't want to start with the United Methodist Church. I want to start with the Bible, because I think that's where we should always start. So, human sexuality in the Bible, particularly homosexual behavior in the Bible, there are traditionally six passages in the Bible that people will point to, people that will read, people try to understand this regarding homosexuality. And that's in Genesis, Leviticus, Romans, Corinthians, Timothy. Now, all these, and I'm not going to read each one of these, but I, I you know, and it's very easy to find these verses, or I'll make you a copy of this page if you would like to look them up for yourselves, but all these passages, again, are complex and can be understood and explored and read uh, and interpreted in more uh, than way. For example, it's pointed out that what is condemned, especially in the Old Testament passages, when it talks about homosexual behavior, really are primarily are acts of violence and acts of abuse. 
uh, rather than what we would refer to as consensual adult behavior. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand these things. Scholars differ in the ways that they read all kinds of biblical uh, passages. Um, the way that homosexuality, a lot of these things, the New Testament stuff was written in kind of in the Roman era. Homosexuality was practiced uh, in the Roman era most often as a practice between unequals of power or older you know, we know more about the male practice of it than the female practice of it, but the, the male practice of it, the Romans typically would practice this with very, very, very young boys. So that was, that was an abusive uh, situation. Um, some people, some Bible scholars on both sides will point out, you know, Jesus never said really anything directly, literally, simply to understand about homosexuality, but... Although in Mark 10, he does kind of mention what a, a normalized marriage should uh, look at. Um, this has all been brought to the forefront. The Methodist Church has been arguing this. The first, you know, we, we talked last time that the Methodist Church was formed in 1968. In 1972 is when we had our first argument about this and when we had our first votes at the general conference level. Uh, about this. Um, it's important to realize that sexuality is a gift from God. And that we are human beings and, and part of us, we are sexual human beings. Uh, sexuality is a gift from God that entails responsibilities. Commitments. Uh, and, 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 and privileges, and at, at, at its best, at its you know, all sides of this sexual issue inside the Methodist Church agree that sexuality should be among equals, not not unequal power, not abusive, but should be between equals and in the context of a committed relationship. Okay, so the 2012 Book of Discipline. Uh, we have a section in there called the Social Principles. And in the Social Principles, there's a section called the Nurturing Community. And that has a subsection called talk, that talks about human sexuality. And it says this, We affirm that sexuality is God's good gift to all persons. And we call everyone to responsible stewardship of this sacred gift. And then a little bit later it says, United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. We confirm, I'm sorry, we affirm, a, affirm, that God's grace is available to all. And then a little bit later it says equal rights regarding sexual orientation. We find certain basic human rights, civil liberties are due all persons. We are committed to supporting these rights and the liberties of all people regardless of their sexual orientation. The issue that often highlights these kind of questions is what is the role of experience in biblical interpretation? So it's that, it's that old Wesleyan quadrilateral thing where Albert Outler did this, and actually Albert Outler <coughs> was a theologian. He did a lot of work at Perkins for a long time where I went to school, and he, he actually later in his life he would comment a little bit off the record. You know, I wish I had never used those four words together, but the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral is to how to understand the Christian life, how to interpret an appropriate thing, a way to behave, a way to act, a way to believe, and it was his, you know, tradition um, and uh, ex the, the Bible, tradition, uh, experience, uh, and, and, and then the leading of, of the Spirit. And he, and he, he, he kind of wished he had not completed all four of those things together because he said, obviously, Holy Scripture supersedes everything. Holy Scripture is the most important thing, and I shouldn't put these other... It's, the quadrilateral doesn't mean that they're all equal things. So just our personal experience is not equal to the message that Scripture often plainly gives us. Uh, 
But scripture is sometimes hard to understand. You know, it, what parts of it are kind of bound up in the time and the culture of that time and that place, and how does that translate into, into us uh, today? The I Methodist Church is part of the universal church. In our, in our liturgy, we say that we are part of the Holy Catholic Church, Catholic with a little c, which means universal. We are part of the universal church. We are part of God's church. We confess the Apostles' Creed. Jesus Christ is proclaimed and confessed as our Lord and our Savior. And as United Methodists, we say all persons who love God and who desire to draw closer to him are welcome to attend our services, are welcome to be part of our church life, are welcome to participate in our programs, are welcome to receive the sacraments of the church. They are welcome to become members of our church. They are welcome to become leaders in our church. There are, however, a couple of tiny little exceptions to this, and it has to do with human sexuality. Uh, one of these things in the Book of Discipline is paragraph 304.3. Qualifications for ordination in the church. It says this, While persons set apart by the church for ordained ministry are subject to all the frailties of the human condition, and the pressures of society, they are required to maintain the highest standards of holy living in the world. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Therefore, self-avowed practicing homosexuals are not to be certified as candidates, ordained as ministers, or appointed to serve in the United Methodist Church. And it continues, a self-avowed practicing homosexual is understood to mean a person openly acknowledges to a bishop, to a district superintendent, to a district committee on ordained ministry, a board of ordained ministry, or a clergy session that they are a practicing homosexual. And there are some footnotes showing all the judicial council, which is kind of like our Supreme Court, the Judicial Council decisions relating to this, and I think a little bit more recently, the Judicial Council has ruled that if a same-sex couple is married, is legally married, which we can, a person can now do in the United States, and you could do in certain states for a long time. They, they now say that if a couple is married, that is the same thing as saying we are practicing our, our homosexuality. So if you are a married couple, same sex, that is the same thing as being a self-avowed practicing homosexual. Um, the Conference Council on Finance has some words about homosexuality inside the United Methodist Church. So the Conference Council of Finance Administration, the people that control all the money, at the general level and the conference level. They have a paragraph in there, 613. It says this, to ensure that no annual conference, board, agency, committee, commissioner, or council shall receive United Methodist funds for any gay caucus uh, or group or otherwise use such funds to promote the acceptance of homosexuality or to violate the express commitment of the UMC not to reject or condemn <clears throat> lesbian or gay members and friends. So you can't, you can't really fund either side of this argument. The council shall have the right to stop all such expenditures. This restriction shall not limit the church's ministry in response to the HIV epidemic, nor shall it preclude funding for dialogue or educational events where the church's official efficient is fairly and equally representative. Um, This has been an issue that we have been arguing about since the 70s, literally for 50 years inside the United Methodist Church. And as you dig into the documents and the polity of the church, there are decisions and things all in it uh, everywhere. The United Methodist Church affirms that sexuality is God's good gift to all persons. 
it's, 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 it's in that statement that I read a few minutes ago about human sexuality. Uh, it, it's one of several statements that the church has on human sexuality. Um, the, the church affirms and says very plainly, very literally, that all persons are of sacred worth. They are equally valuable on the side of God. And the church is committed to ministry to all of God's children. And the church implores families and churches not to reject or to condemn lesbian or gay members and friends uh, of the church. And kind of underlying this whole thing is, is uh, you, you know, we have a constitution. If you look in the very front of the Book of Discipline, we have a constitution that we follow in the church. There is a constitutional principle about inclusive, uh, the inclusiveness of the church. Everyone is welcome. Everyone can come and join us for worship. Everyone can participate in the life uh, of the church. And that doesn't have anything to do with your sexual orientation or your sexual practice. Um, now, unfortunately, Fortunately, some, some, it's, this is a hot-button issue with some people on both ends of the spectrum of this. And I, I do know, even in this church, for us, there was a former pastor that informed a couple that they could not go to church here because they were gay. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about the big church and the big thing, you know, but that, I mean, it, it, I mean, I'm talking about our church. I'm talking about right here. Uh, this was some time ago, but he, he, I, I, I think I, I wasn't there, but I, I, I heard about it, but I, and I, I think he was polite about it, but he was very firm about it. They, you know, you, you, you can't go to church here because you were gay. Well, I, I, I don't think he's ever read any of this. You, you can go to church here if you are gay. Uh, we first openly debated about this in 1972. That was only four years after the formation of the United Methodist Church. Uh, they put a statement in there. It affirmed the belief people of homosexual orientation are persons of sacred worth who need, like we all need, the ministry and the guidance of the church. Uh, and then they put in this phrase, the church does not condone the practice of homosexualities and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. And you've heard me say that before, and I've said it a couple of times already this evening, but it is a very important phrase. They put it in there in 1972, and there are groups inside the church that have been trying to take that specific phrase out ever since, but the only way that you can take that out is with a majority vote, of the delegates at General Conference, and for the last 50 years, they have not taken that phrase out. The United Methodist Church very distinctly says that sexual relations are affirmed, supported by the church, only within the covenant of monogamous, heterosexual, hetero, heterosexual, Thank you. Need another coffee. You know, it, it, the, the church, the Methodist church, our official documents very clearly say marriage is between a man and a woman, and you can only have sexual relations in a married relationship. As you would kind of think a church would say that if you are traditional in your understanding and belief of the church. So let, let's, let's talk about some of the things. So that is one restriction that the church has. Let's talk about some restrictions that the church has on homosexual behavior because uh, particularly clergy, we have some additional restrictions that members don't have. Um, pastors, you know, ordained clergy, pastors may not be, quote, self-avowed practicing homosexuals. And we may not conduct ceremonies to have a wedding or to celebrate a wedding or a union. Or, you know, before it was legal to be married, they would have a union. 
And you can't do those kinds of things on church property. Say, well, I'm not allowed to do it, but they're going to do it inside the sanctuary. I just will be out of town that day, so I won't get in trouble. Well, you can't do it on church property either. The United Methodist Church has a membership of 12 million <coughs> members. So that means that there are 12 million opinions on how we should live together, work together, what we should do. 12 million people are going to have disagreements. Sandra and I have been married for 39 years. We have disagreements. But we always work them out. 12 million people are going to have a lot of disagreements. The General Conference is the only body that speaks for the church. All the delegates that get elected by these 12 million members, and then several thousand people will gather for these big uh, meetings. And they've been talking about this since 1972. They've been talking about it for a long time. And as the years have gone by, it has gotten more and more divisive. It has gotten more and more disruptive. Um, certain groups, you know, demand to be heard. They, they've interrupted meetings. They have done, well, sometimes they protest to the point where they're arrested. Which, and, and that's when the TV camera's always there when people get arrested at, you know, the, the International Methodist Church meeting, they're arresting some of their members that are protesting certain, well. We talked last session about our general conferences and how we meet every four years, and that in 2018, they said, you know what, we're not gonna argue about that this year. We're gonna set aside a special session in 2019, just before the pandemic, we're going to have a special called meeting of the General Conference specifically to address ongoing, unresolved divisions regarding homosexuality. And they did. They had a special meeting of the General Conference. Well, that's all that they talked. They said, let's, let's get together. Let's work this out. Let's just, let, let, let's, let's agree and move forward because we don't need to keep fighting about this because there's work to be done and we're wasting so much time and energy and effort on this. So what they did, instead of liberalizing or loosening church restrictions on this, actually they made the restrictions tighter. And, and, and Maybe a lot of you don't know that, and it's probably because I don't talk about it enough, because it's my job to communicate these things to you. But in 2019, <clears throat> if a clergy person officiates at a same-sex wedding, it's now in our Book of Discipline that there, there is a mandatory minimum sentence. There is a mandatory minimum negative thing that will happen to you if you do this, if you are convicted of this in a church trial. Did you know that we have church trials? Not officially. We didn't know. <laughs> I've been through a lot of trials in the church. Never, never, never an official <laughs> church <clears throat> trial. And they restricted a little bit more of the language. They made it, they, they eliminated a little bit of the wiggle room and a couple of Things And so what has happened is that the people that don't agree with this were outraged. And actually, they, they, they were, there's kind of now kind of outright over resistance to it. Um, so you see people openly, certain conferences that, that, that kind of, I don't like labels, but we'll call them liberal conferences, um, have openly ordained practicing homosexual clergy. Just a few weeks ago, we had some jurisdictional meetings where some new bishops were elected. And once again, a jurisdiction has elected a 
same-sex married clergy person to be a bishop. And they're not our only one. So how many of these people have been tried? <laughs> and, okay. So, zero. zero. Right. So writing it in the book is no good if it's not important. Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I can't, I, I think it's Bishop Oliveto. Uh, I believe she's in Northern California. I'm, I might, it might be Southern California. I might be wrong. Uh, she was the first openly self-avowed professing homosexual. I mean, she's married to a woman. Uh, she was elected bishop. Uh, there were some things filed, and but that was a few years ago, and she is still in process with those charges. So I, I, I might be getting her name wrong because it, it's just off the, uh, the top of my head. Pastor. Yes. It, it, I, I've got to believe, but if, if I could just, uh, the more I, I, I get into this, and, and I almost want to, re, almost in a way, refuse to get into this debate. The, the way I see this is we're given an option or, or giving uh, an option to get our property back. To me, that seems to be the big issue to me. Because uh, I don't like to, I don't like to exclude anyone. Right. Uh, and I'm convinced there are plenty of gay people in heaven. And uh, and so I don't like to be pushed in a corner and, and, and you're either this way or that way. If, is, is there, what, what would the United Methodist or Holston Conference say if we said, we will remain, let us have our property back and we'll stay in the Holston Conference. What will they say? And, and the reason why I say that is it gives, it takes the option off of us. If they say, no, you cannot do that, then, because last week we argued over the issue, we don't know what's going to happen in 2024. Exactly. That's what the DS is saying. Look, just hang on, hang, look, I don't care to hang on if we get our property back. If they're, if they're not willing to, if the whole church is about to implode, and they're not willing to do that because I think we discussed that the global church doesn't require the conveyance of property. Correct. And so, if if there was a way we because if if we disengage, then we will be referred. Oh, that's that they don't have anything to do with gay people. That means you're just labeled out. And so, to and I really hate to get into argument with anyone is. To me, the issue for us as, as, as a congregation is this property. That we, we don't own the property. If we can get the property back, all options are on the table. If we don't get our property back, my, my understanding, my reading of this is that if you remain in the continuing United Methodist Church, you are still subject to what is called the trust clause, which means the local church holds the property in trust for the larger church and that we don't own this property if if we continue to remain in what is now referred to as the United Methodist Church. And there is not an option to, to, to keep your stuff, to revoke your trust clause. That 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 is not on an that is not an option. I, I, I would I would I probably agree with that. Is there something wrong with us forwarding a letter to someone in in a position of supervisor just to ask the question and have them say no? Uh, I would be happy to uh, to draft a letter. I will show it to you for your review, and then we will send it. Uh, the the actually the the appropriate person to send that to would be the conference board of trustees because they are the people that are specifically charged with dealing with property matters inside. Uh, the church. And that, that would probably maybe resolve the issue for those who are sort of on the fence and, and thinking maybe we should wait to 2024. If there was an option for, if they don't give us that option, then to me, it's not an issue about homosexuality. It's, I don't know what the big church is going to do, but all I know is this is our time, this is our opportunity to get this property back. 
And we'll figure out which way to go forward after. If you if you'll look on the on the, the schedule here of upcoming things, one one of the meetings that we I can't remember what I titled it, but it's about money and property. Financial consideration. I call it financial sharing. I should have just called it money, 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 because that's what it's about. Uh, who's got the money? Who controls the money? Who keeps the money? Who who has who has the authority to come in and take your money if they so desire? Um, we're going to talk about all of this stuff a lot at that session. It does say here that if we withdraw from the church, if we do withdraw from it and decide in 2024 if everything's right, we, we have our property when we withdraw, we could rejoin the United Methodist Church if we desire to. They want you to pay the property. Well, that would be our decision to do what? I, I, you, they don't do anything for us, as far as I know. So I'm with you. The property is their issue. We have to get it. And, 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 and I'm also confused to be drawn into this debate over homosexuality. If this is an opportunity for this church to get this property back. Yes. And, we, and that to me is. And well, so well, when I talk about, when we do the session on financial considerations, the, the focus of that meeting will be specifically, let's look at this from a financial slash business point of view. We're going to evaluate this not on theology. We're going to not talk about spirituality. We're just going to talk about the business side of it. And they are giving churches an opportunity to keep all your stuff, to leave for what is essentially a very nominal fee, and then control your own destiny in the future. And from a strictly business, practical point of view, I'm not sure why you would not want to take that opportunity because it may not and probably will not ever be offered again just like this. That, that seems to me to be the issue. But, but I, you know, I almost think of Lincoln uh, in, in Fort Sumter where he refused. He was not it was union all the way. If we forward a letter or a request and say, will you convey the property back to us and we will not exercise, and if they say no, we've got our answer. It's a real simple, at that point in time, it becomes strictly business. It's for the benefit and the financial benefit of this church. We know that it's their decision. You know, if they say, well, we'll give it back to you, and if you'll stay a member, I don't know if they can do that. I doubt that. It, it's a, but at least we, we put the onus on them instead of it being placed on us. Yes. They make the call and they say, look, we tried. We tried to stay. I gotta go be in and, and we may all vote for the same thing for totally different reasons. Right. That's right. You know? And you know, I guess one of my concerns is if they have chosen not to do anything with the people who are ignoring the book of discipline, if you as the pastor refuse to conduct the same-sex marriage, are they going to turn a blind eye to you? Or are you going to find out what trials in the church are really about? Well, I, I, I can tell you what they say at the moment. Okay. They say at the moment, here's a, here's a hypothetical, and this, this has been explained to me by more than one person who should know and it is said uh, if a church stays in the continuing United Methodist Church and the church says and in 2024 they say well homosexual clergy is okay and homosexual marriage inside the church is okay I have been specifically told that individual churches will be given the option please don't send us a, a openly practicing gay clergy person because, because in you know in, in our context in our community in our culture right here right now that's just not going to work right but that didn't answer my question and so the, the other side of that is no pastor is going to be required okay. to officiate as something that violates their conscience <laughs> so they say, oh, well, this, this homosexuality, this homosexual couple wants to have a wedding in your church. You have to do it, and you have to officiate. Well, no, I don't. And, I, and I've been told, you, you can say, you know, I, I, it's a matter of conscience for me, so I prefer, I elect not to do it. And 
your church can say, you can't do that in our building either. But no, none of that is written down. Right. So who <laughs> pays the liability for that? I mean, think about the bakeries that refuse to bake cakes. Where are they it, it's up? it's astounding that we act, it's astounding that the Methodist Church actually has not been sued over this, and it's not gone to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But remember, we are the second largest Protestant denomination in the United States. The Baptist Church has not been sued over this, and the Catholic Church, which also doesn't allow that, uh, they haven't been sued over it either. So the Catholic Church is the largest, the, ba the Baptist is next, and then the Methodist. Why why would you sue number three? Why don't you just sue? <laughs> Or I guess you could sue number one, number two, and number three all at the same time and just get it all but done. I don't understand <clears throat> if you said that they tightened it up in 2019 and then a few rogue people didn't like the tightening up. Actually, why, actually why, quite a few rogue yeah. people. How does it balance in numbers? They were in a significant minority. Excuse me? They are in a significant minority. The, the ones that... The ones that openly want to... So why are they getting the church? That's the question I had. If they broke, if they broke the discipline laws, <laughs> why, are we, may, why, may, may, why are we having to <laughs> make the decision? Yeah. Because they did a better job of nominating people to, to the control the yeah. They have the bosses in place? Yeah. Well, let... let I've, I've, th I've thought about this long and hard, and let me answer this very carefully. From a strictly operational, practical, financial, business, corporate culture kind of a thing, if you want to form a new traditional expression of Wesleyan theology, you don't want it. You don't want those 11 general agencies. You don't want their $100 million budget. You don't want their bloated bureaucracy. You don't want all their liabilities. You don't want it. And the very traditional people that want to leave, at first I said, man, why are you leaving? And the more I thought about it, I went, oh my God. So you're saying the time has come. It's genius. Let them have it. Getting rid of the big government. That, you know, that, ti that Titanic is slowly sinking. Keep it. We're, we're, we're going to take the good lifeboats. We're going to leave. We're going to build a new ship. You can, you can have the old leaky one that doesn't work very well. And that, I, I hope that doesn't sound harsh, but because I don't mean it to be harsh. But I think many of us would agree, and my personal opinion is, if they've got too many employees, they got their fingers in too many things that don't have anything to do with God's church or human spirituality. It's too political. It's too bureaucratic. I mean, they rub shoulders with people that, you know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with what God wants his church to do in this world. And, yeah. Other questions about, about anything con concerning disaffiliation? Once, uh, I'm not a member, but I'm asking the question anyway. Once you disavow, if you choose to go that direction, is the global church large enough to handle all the big things that, like the pension and healthcare, as a group? Uh, yes, that I mean that that's an excellent question because I mean it goes down to the practicality of it, you know, and the money. And it, I mean, are are they going to be financially viable? Are they going to be able to survive and you know thrive? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, let's do pensions first. Uh, pensions are done worldwide from a group called Westpath, who manages all the pensions for United Methodist Church, and it is it literally it is billions of dollars. Uh, they have already said they will be glad to segregate and manages, manage pension funds for new expressions. Of, so essentially, it's just like Charles Schwab has more than one retirement account, account more than one company. Westpath can have a pension account for more than one church. Okay, so with that being said, does once the split, maybe it's already occurred, did that large sum that was originally there 
and any of it moved to the global. So the global is now starting off new. Yes. From from zero. Yes. So it's not funded. It doesn't need to be funded. There's nothing to fund. <laughs> Let, let's let's look at this from the perspective of a clergy person. Okay. So I've been doing this for 20 years. So I'm covered under three separate different little plans because that's why I do it. Uh, if I I have a lot of options, I can stay with the continuing United Methodist Church and then continue to get contributions, you know, every month into my pension plan and then my other voluntary plan that I put pre-tax money into. Uh, and, 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 you know, and I'm covered by some of their other stuff as well. Uh, and that just continues. So that's option number one. Option number two is, you know, I can just retire, which means, you know, you can retire whenever you want, right? You can retire, you can have early retirement or regular retirement. And yeah, a clergy person can retire anytime they want to. It's just early or not. So you can retire, which means you start getting payments from that pension fund. Or you can decide to leave the United Methodist Church, join the, for this example, join the Global Methodist Church. Well, that means in the Global Methodist Church, I'll just have a brand new plan. It's just like changing jobs. You know, I'm still eligible for those benefits that I got for that big company that I worked for for 20 years. But now I've resigned and I've gone to work for a new company. I still get the pension from the company that I work for for today. That's why they have billions of dollars and that's why it's a very legal thing. And that's why, yeah, they can't touch that money. I mean, it's, well, yeah, don't go down that road. Westpath is a very well-run company. They're very transparent. You know, that was my business for a long time. I mean, I, I read their stuff. They're, yeah, that money is sitting there and it is well invested and there's, it's billions of dollars and that's what they use to fund the pensions for all these pastors that have been here for the last 50 years. And there's, there, there's no reason to break that up. That money belongs to, it is for the benefit of the retirement of the pastors that paid into that system over all the years. And the churches pay that money on behalf of the issue. It's an employee benefit. And once you pay it in, it then belongs to the employee. I mean, you just look at employment law or retirement law. It, you know, it doesn't belong to the United Methodist Church. It belongs to, for the benefit of, you know, the employees, the, the retirees. That, that's who that money belongs to. You know, I've done a lot of reading recently, and I've read about 300 pages of stuff about, for example, the Global Methodist Church. You can go on their website, and you can see how they're organized. You can see their finances. You can see the whole, the whole thing. It's very transparent. 80% of the people who are currently members of the Global Methodist Church are previous members of the United Methodist Church. Yes. Around the world. Yes. And their polity is really quite similar to that of the United Methodist Church. There are some differences. Their finances and how they're organized and their, to use a word that we all know, bureaucracy, they, they have a structure too. But it's way more, for the lack of a better word, lean than that of the United Methodist Church. There isn't a bloated bureaucracy. Yes, in, yeah, in modern corporate speak, their organization is flat. Right. Yeah. To, give you, to give you an example, in the Global Methodist Church in the United States, there are three bishops. Three. Yep. Oh, how many are there in the United Methodist Church? I would think you, 80. Would you guess? 80 probably. 80 something. Yeah, for the same, the same geographic area. So there are lots of similarities, but there are some key differences. On there, and I would I would encourage you if you if you're if you're interested and um, and I, I can send it to you if you'd like. But there are there are links and FAQs on their website which you can look at that are very clear, very well written, um, and um, I, there's you know the finance their finances are really secure. You know they officially started on in May of 2022. But let me assure you, there is no lack of financial issues. I mean, 
security and security. they they are not going to have an issue moving forward being financially viable absolutely as an organization not. yeah they they yeah it, it, it's yeah it's and not they a, do it's, not have the property trust clause they do not have the property trust clause yeah, right. yeah every church in the global method church will own their own every local church will own the property where they meet on sunday morning that's correct do they have a structure for uh for assigning pastors to yes. churches? Yes. They do. The system is very, very similar, similar in a lot of ways. Very, very similar. So you similar. won't have to go out on your own looking for somebody? It's, no. It's very similar. They, we're going to have a session of, you know, where, if, if we don't stay here, where do we go? And I'm going to talk a lot about the Global Methodist Church. Uh, but they already have a book of yeah, discipline. Where do we go? They, already, they already have a book of discipline. It is online. You can read it. And then you can find some, and I, during that meeting, I'll, I'll give you the chart that shows here are the major differences between the UMC and the And they have a the transitional Global. document as well. And there, there are some in East Tennessee, there's some meetings coming up where they are going to, you know, answer questions and explain differences and similarities and stuff like that. There's some upcoming meetings. There's one in Alcoa, and there's a couple other in, the, in this region coming up in the next month or so. So, so to, to be clear, though, the if a congregational vote takes place in February with the DS here, that is a vote solely on uh, leaving the United Methodist Church. It's not a it's not contingent on who else will to join. That will be a, a separate process. I think it's great that Lawrence is going to tell us what some of our options are so that we're not blind and there's more than one option yeah but but there won't there won't be a valid option that says i want to disaffiliate and go here or disaffiliate and go here or that that one vote will be disaffiliation or not and, and we as a yeah, congregation yeah. have to decide once you get divorced or once you break up with your girlfriend they don't get to tell you who you get to date from then on yeah <laughs> All right. They try. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the vote, what, the, the, the question before us is do we disaffiliate with the United Methodist Church or not? And then the question is, you know, it's a flow chart. Then where? If, if we're leaving, where do we go? Well, that's, a, that's another long discussion. And before you leave, so it's... You well, I mean... We continue. We just I mean, we're talking about different yeah. options and that yeah. sort of thing. And I, I think if it, if and when it gets to that point, we'll have a really good idea of where we think we should be going. Is there, I mean, or like, is the global church, the, will they have to approve us? Or will... Yes. There, yeah. There's a process yes. by there a process? which you yeah. apply, but... I can tell you it's not complicated. But, but remember, you know, it won't be, what are we going to do next Sunday? Right. If, right. if we yeah, vote to disaffiliate, go through the pro there's a known date that's at the end of May. It's months and so months. We still months. have time yeah. to work on we where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So if we, if we disaffiliate on the vote day, and you decide to stay with United Methodist, you just leave us? <laughs> Is that the way that would go? No, that would no. that would take effect on the effective date, which I believe is March 29th. Okay. March 29th. Or it, it's, it's, it's it was in the document I gave you last time. The, the deadline. Yes. Um, That'll be your Sunday to preach, baby. <laughs> we, have to, we have some good studies on that. I'll tell you where we'll not be lost. But I just, and you I know, I'm. stays with us, whatever we decide. And, and, and let, me, let, let me say this you know, inside here, I've got very strong opinions. But when I'm standing up here talking in front of my church about this kind of stuff, this is not the place for me to insert my opinions to try to influence the people around me. Okay, everybody in here is a intelligent adult, and you have to make up your own mind. You got to make your own decision, and it's not. I I I don't think it's right for a pastor to to try to influence people right. emotionally. Oh well, if y'all do that, I'm going to leave. I agree. Oh, yeah, you got to be careful when you say that. Where some people might say, "Oh yeah, let's do this because we want them to leave." <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to resort to emotional, 
I'm not going to tug on people's heartstrings about you this. Just give them the facts. Up. I, I I think my job, my role here is to give the congregation, you know, communicate it. It's complicated. We want to talk about it, answer all your questions. I want to give you all the facts, all the options, and then you decide. It's, and then after this church decides, I will personally decide what I think I need to be doing at that moment and moving forward. But until then, it's, it's, it's premature for me to, to speculate on what I may or may not do. I think we all need to remember that discernment does not equal disaffiliation. Discernment means deciding what our options, but from knowing what our options are and then learning about each of those options so we can make a well-informed decision. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it's all about. I mean, and we, you, will, we will all do that. I mean, have you have you read Proverbs? <laughs> be smart. Be practical. Be wise. Yeah. Work hard. Do the proper thing. I mean, all of this stuff. I mean, Christianity is very and, and Wesleyan theologically is very practically minded. So you know, let, let let let's do that. Let's be practical and pragmatic. Uh, and deeply spiritual at the same time. Because you can do you can do both. Let's make sure we do not get caught up in what I call divisive issues. Yes. Human sexuality. Yeah. That's one issue. Period. That is one That's issue. Not the biggest issue. There We've been issues. down this road before. We've seen this play out before. And if you get caught up in those debates, it doesn't end well for anybody involved. Because in our time, in our culture today, people have very strong opinions. Some people at the at the end of both of the spectrums have very very strong opinions. Their 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 opinions are not going to be changed. Right. You know, so, if, if you look at the facts, there are just as many financial issues around this as there are anything. Happening. That's the bottom line: is the financial issues. There's a lot of financial issues in terms of property issues. <laughs> liability of the United Methodist Church, which is growing, yep. uh, apportionment disagreements and dialogue, and lots of other things. So we just need to make sure we're all well informed about all the different options. So well, I'll, I'll talk about this during money and then in later sessions, but the, the, the polity, the, the, the thing that they've already talked about for the global Methodist Church, apportionments will be much lower. Way lower. Because you don't, there's not all this bureaucracy you support. So, and they think the work of the, they think the work of the local church is done at the local level. There's a thought. What a concept. <laughs> where does where UMCOR fall in any of this? UMCOR is a freestanding chartered thing, and it will continue to be a freestanding chartered thing. But it is part of United Methodist. It is, uh, it is one of the, the um, it, yeah. That's the UMCOR part. I think some of these general agencies may be spun out as independent things for, for financial and, and, and for legal reasons. They may just spin these things out. They separately. could make it an encore. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in the news today, I was reading more and more annual conferences are meeting and they're having these special called meetings. Uh, United Methodist churches are leaving by literally the thousands. Yeah, read somewhere today, 30 a day. 30 a day? That sounds about right. You know, five or six hundred in Texas, you know, hundreds in North Carolina, hundreds in Alabama. I mean, just run down the lit. And, it's, and we're still relatively early in this process because we have until the end, you know, this, you know, until next year for all this, you know, to have, there, there's an end date and it's actually next year. So. Keep it positive. Keep it focused. In all things, in all times, God is good. Yes. All the time. All the time. Thank you very much. God bless you. Go with God. We will we will meet again next week. God bless you.